Section 60 of Word Portraits of Famous Writers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Word Portraits of Famous Writers. Edited by Mabel E. Watton. Charles Lever, 1806-1872. to 1872. From Fitzpatrick's Life of Lever I found him seated at an open window, a bottle of claret at his right hand, and the proof-sheets of Lord Kilgobbin before him. At the date of our visit he looked a hale, hearty, laughter-loving man of sixty. There was mirth in his grey eye, joviality in the wink that twitted on his eyelid, saucy humour in his smile, and bon mot, wit, repartee, and rejoinder in every movement of his lips. His hair, very thin, but of a silky brown, fell across his forehead, and when it curtained his eyes he would jerk back his head. This, too, at some telling crisis in a narrative, when the particular action was just the exact finish required to make the story perfect. Mr. Lever's teeth were all his own, and very brilliant, and whether from accident or habit, he flashed them on us in conjunction with his wonderful eyes, a battery at once powerful and irresistible. Mr. Lever made great use of his hands, which were small and white and delicate as those of a woman. He made play with them, threw them up in ecstasy or wrung them in mournfulness, just as the action of the moment demanded. He did not require eyes or teeth with such a voice and such hands. They could tell and illustrate the workings of his brain. He was somewhat careless in his dress, but clung to the traditional high shirt-collar, merely compromising the unswerving stock of the Brummel period. End of section 60。section 61 of Word Portraits of Famous Writers。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter. Word Portraits of Famous Writers. Edited by Mabel E. Wotton. Matthew Gregory Lewis, 1775 to 1818. From the Southern Literary Messenger, 1849. In person, Matt Lewis, as his intimate friends at first termed him, was quite ordinary. His stature was rather diminutive. His face was almost an ellipse, looking upon it from the side, and his features, though pleasant, were not to be regarded as handsome. His forehead, however, was high, and his eyes very lustrous. From Jefferson's Novels and Novelists Lewis's personal appearance was not prepossessing. He describes himself as of passion strong, of hasty nature, of graceless form and dwarfish stature. He had, moreover, large grey eyes, thick features, and an inexpressive countenance. When he talked, he had an insufferable habit of drawing the forefinger of his right hand across his eyelid, and in conversation he was guilty of that absurd affectation of a drawling tone such as was popular with dandies from new monthly magazine 1848 matthew gregory lewis of this gentleman i knew but little not having encountered him half a dozen times after my introduction to him at the house of nat middleton the banker with a short thick-set figure unintellectual features and a disagreeable habit of peering, being very short-sighted. His aspect was by no means prepossessing, but as he had that within which passeth show, he recovered the ground lost at starting as rapidly as Wilkes could have done. End of section 61《Section 62 of Word Portraits of Famous Writers》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Robinson. 
Word Portraits of Famous Writers, edited by Mabel E. Watton. John Gibson Lockhart, 1794 to 1854. From the Times, 9th of December, 1854. Endowed with the very highest order of manly beauty, both of features and expression, he retained the brilliancy of youth and a stately strength of person comparatively unimpaired in ripened life. And then, though sorrow and sickness suddenly brought on a premature old age, which none could witness unmoved, yet the beauty of the head and of the bearing so far gained in melancholy loftiness of expression what they lost in animation, that the last phase, whether to the eye of a painter or of an anxious friend, seemed always the finest. End of section 62. Recording by Robert Robinson. Section 63 of Word Portraits of Famous Writers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen. Word Portraits of Famous Writers. Edited by Mabel E. Watton. Sir Richard Lovelace, 1618 to 1658. From Anthony Woods, Athenae Oxoniensis. Richard Lovelace became a gent commoner of Gloucester Hall in the beginning of the year 1634, and in that of his age sixteen, being then accounted the most amiable and beautiful person that ever I beheld, a person also of innate modesty, virtue, and courtly deportment, which made him then, but especially after, when he retired to the great city, much admired and adored by the female sex. Accounted by all those that well knew him, to have been a person well versed in the Greek and Latin poets, in music, whether practical or theoretical, instrumental or vocal, and in other things befitting a gentleman. Some of the said persons have also added in my hearing, that his common discourse was not only significant and witty, but incomparably graceful, which drew respect from all men and women. 1634 and 1658. From the Gentleman's Magazine, 1884. Asterisk. The personal attractions of Richard Lovelace have been much extolled by his contemporaries. Nor is this matter for wonder. A picture of the poet by an unknown painter preserved in the old college at Dulwich, to which it was bequeathed by Cartwright the actor in 1687, represents him as a very handsome man. The face is oval. The hair, worn cavalier fashion, long, is of a dark brown color and falls down in abundant masses, while the mustachios are small and thin. The small, well-formed mouth is perhaps a trifle voluptuous, but is nevertheless suggestive of firmness of character. The eyes are large and dark, and the well-arched and delicately penciled eyebrows are unusually far apart. The general expression of the face is singularly sweet and winning. The hand is small, well-formed and aristocratic. Lovelace is attired in armor with a white collar, and across the breast is thrown a red scarf. The picture is inscribed, Colonel Lovelace. End of section 63 Section 64 of Word Portraits of Famous Writers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. Word Portraits of Famous Writers. Edited by Mabel E. Watton. Edward Lord Lytton, 1803-1873. From S.C. Hall's Retrospect of a Long Life. A young man whose features, though of a somewhat effeminate cast, were remarkably handsome. His bearing had that aristocratic something bordering on hauteur, which clung to him during his life. I never saw a famous writer without being reminded of the passage, Stand back, I am holier than thou. 1826 The last time I saw him was in his then residence, number 12, Grosvenor Square. It was growing towards fifty years since first we had met and there were more changes in him than those that time usually brings. His once handsome face had assumed the desolation without the dignity of age. His locks, once brown, inclining to auburn, were shaggy and grizzled. 
his mouth seldom smiling even in youth was close shut his whole aspect had something in it at once painful and unpleasant about eighteen seventy two from appleton's journal eighteen seventy three Bulwer is described as having been, at this period of his first brilliant triumph, rather taller than the middle height, with a graceful slender figure, well-proportioned limbs and a countenance stamped with distinctly aristocratic features and expression, his dark brown curly hair, his large and bright blue eye, his decided, though delicately formed aquiline nose, his rather full and handsome mouth, his patrician, almost haughty pose and manner, as seen at that time are dwelt on, with true feminine enthusiasm, by a lady who frequented the circles of which he was regarded as one of the most shining ornaments. 1828. From Appleton's Journal, 1873. It was my fortune to see Bulwer in the House of Commons in 1863 and 1865, and in the House of Lords, to which he had recently risen, in 1868. He then had the appearance of being a man of some fifty years, tallish, straight, stiff, and proudly sedate. His long, sombre face was no longer fair, but was yellow and wrinkled, while the almost cadaverous aspect of his features added to the really far from proportionate prominence of his long, aquiline nose. He now wore a moustache with his heavy red whiskers, which had themselves become a dull brown, plentifully sprinkled with grey, and upon his chin he grew an imperial. His hair was still thick, but no trace of its rich auburn hue of youth remained. It was a heavy gray in color. Spectacles partially concealed the large but now dulled and glassy blue eyes, and the whole appearance was far from prepossessing. On the former occasion referred to, I heard him address the house in an eloquent and evidently carefully prepared speech of half an hour. His manner was quiet and subdued, his voice no longer lover-like and sweet, but rather harsh and grating, and his declamation humdrum. Occasionally a spark of the old animation appeared, when he drew himself up to the full height, and, for the moment, seemed a very orator in motion as in speech. But the spark soon vanished, and he was again Pelham grown old, the exhausted and melancholy bow and wit of the past, struggling through an imposed task. His dress was conspicuously plain, almost stiff and ministerial, though there was something about the attire of the neck which seemed a suspicion of a relic of dandyism. End of section 64。section 65 of word portraits of famous writers。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer、please visit librivox.org。recording by Marianne Spiegel。Word Portraits of Famous Writers, edited by Mabel E. Watton. Thomas Babington Macaulay, 1800-1859. From Trevelyan's Life and Letters of Lord Macaulay. Macaulay's outward man was never better described than in two sentences of Praed's introduction to Knight's Quarterly Magazine. There came up a short manly figure, marvelously upright, with a bad neckcloth, and one hand in his waistcoat pocket. Of regular beauty he had little to boast, but in faces where there is an expression of great power, or of great good humor, or both, you do not regret its absence. This picture, in which every touch is correct, tells all that there is to be told. He had a massive head, and features of a powerful and rugged cast, but so constantly lit up by every joyful and ennobling emotion that it mattered little if, when absolutely quiescent, his face was rather homely than handsome. While conversing at table, no one thought him otherwise than good-looking, but, when he rose, he was seen to be short and stout in figure. At Holland House the other day, writes his sister Margaret, in September 1831, Tom met Lady Lyndhurst for the first time. She said to him, "'Mr. Macaulay, you are so different to what I had expected. I thought you were dark and thin.' but you are fair, and, really, Mr. Macaulay, you are fat. He at all times sat and stood straight, full and square, and in this respect Woolner, in the fine statue at Cambridge, has missed what was undoubtedly the most marked fact in his personal appearance. He dressed badly, but not cheaply. His clothes, though ill put on, were good, and his wardrobe was always enormously overstocked. 
1822 and 1831. From Crab Robinson's Diary I went to James Stephen, and drove with him to his house at Hendon, a dinner party. I had a most interesting companion, in young Macaulay, one of the most promising of the rising generation I have seen for a long time. He has a good face, not the delicate features of a man of genius and sensibility, but the strong lines and well-knit limbs of a man sturdy in body and mind, very eloquent and cheerful, overflowing with words, and not poor in thought, liberal in opinion but not radical. He seems a correct as well as a full man. He showed a minute knowledge of subjects not introduced by himself. 1826 from S. C. Hall's Retrospect of a Long Life. I never heard Macaulay speak in the house, where, although by no means an orator, he always made a strong impression. He spoke as he wrote, eloquently, in the choicest diction, smooth, easy, graceful, and ever to the purpose, striving to convince rather than persuade, and grudging no toil of preparation to sustain an argument or enforce a truth. His person was in his favor, in form as in mind he was robust, with a remarkably intelligent expression, aided by deep blue eyes that seemed to sparkle, and a mouth remarkably flexible. His countenance was certainly well calculated to impress on his audience the classical language ever at his command. So faithfully did it mirror the high intelligence of the speaker. I found him, as the world found him, a man of rare intelligence, deep research, and untiring energy in pursuit of facts, also a kind, courteous, and unaffected gentleman. His memory is to me one of the pleasantest I can recall. End of section 65。section 66 of Word Portraits of Famous Writers。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are the public domain。for more information or to volunteer、please visit LibriVox.org。recording by Marianne。Word Portraits of Famous Writers, edited by Mabel E. Watton. William McGinn, 1793-1842. From William McGinn's Miscellanies. All were standing, all were listening to someone who sat in the middle of a group. A low-seated man, short in stature, was uttering pleasantries and scattering witticisms about him with the careless glee of his country. His articulation was impeded by a stutter, yet the sentences he stammered forth were brilliant repartees uttered without sharpness and edged rather with humour than with satire his countenance was rather agreeable than striking its expression sweet rather than bright the grey hair coming straight over his forehead gave a singular appearance to a face still bearing the attributes of youth he was thirty or thereabouts but his thoughtful brow his hair and the paleness of his complexion gave him many of the attributes of age his conversation was careless and off-hand, and, but for the impediment of speech, would have had the charm of a rich comedy. His choice of words was such as I have rarely met with in any of my contemporaries. 1824. From Bentley's Miscellany, 1842. I dined today at the Salopian with Dr. McGinn. He is a most remarkable fellow. His flow of ideas is incredibly quick, and his articulation so rapid that it is difficult to follow him. He is altogether a person of vast acuteness, celerity of apprehension, and indefatigable activity both of mind and body. He is about my own height, but I could allow him an inch round the chest. His forehead is very finely developed, his organ of language and ideality large, and his reasoning faculties excellent. His hair is quite grey, although he does not look more than forty. I imagined he was much older looking, and that he wore a wig, while conversing his eye is never a moment at rest in fact his whole body is in motion and he keeps scrawling grotesque figures upon the paper before him and rubbing them out as fast as he draws them he and gifford are as you know joint editors of the standard from the dublin university magazine 1844 well does the writer of this notice recollect the feelings with which he first wended to the residence of his late friend he was then but a mere boy, fresh from the university. He went and was shown upstairs. The doctor was not at home, but was momentarily expected. Suddenly, when his heart almost sank within him, a light step was heard ascending the stairs. It could not be a man's foot. No, it was too delicate for that. 
it must certainly be the nursery maid the step was arrested at the door a brief interval and mcginn entered the spell vanished like lightning and the visitor took heart in a moment no formal-looking personage in contemporary suit of solemn black stood before him but a slight boyish careless figure with a blue eye the mildest ever seen hair not exactly white but of a sunned snow color an easy familiar smile and a countenance that you would be more inclined to laugh with than feel terror from he bounded across the room with a most unscholar-like eagerness and warmly welcomed the visitor asking him a thousand questions and putting him at ease with himself in a moment then taking his arm both sallied forth into the street where for a long time the visitor was in doubt whether it was mcginn to whom he was really talking as familiarly as if he were his brother or whether the whole was a dream and such indeed was the impression generally made upon the minds of all strangers but as in the present case it was dispelled instantly the living original appeared then was to be seen the kindness and gentleness of heart which tinged every word and gesture with sweetness the suavity and mildness so strongly the reverse of what was to be expected from the most galling satirist of the day the openness of soul and countenance that disarmed even the bitterest of his opponents the utter absence of anything like prejudice and bigotry from him the ablest and most devoted champion of the church and state no pedantry in his language no stateliness of style no forced metaphors no inappropriate anecdote no overwhelming confidence all easy simple agreeable and unzoned end of section 66section sixty seven of word portraits of famous writers this is the librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by marianne word portraits of famous writers edited by mabel e wotton francis mahoney father prout eighteen o five to eighteen sixty six from the works of father prout stooping his short and spare but thick-set frame as he walked wearing his ill-brushed hat upon the extreme back of his head clothed in the slovenliest way in a semi-clerical dress of the shabbiest character he sauntered by with his right arm habitually clasped behind him in his left hand altogether presenting to view so distinctly the appearance of a member of one of the mendicant orders that upon one occasion in the rue de rivoli an intimate friend of his found it impossible to resist the impulse of slipping a sou into the open hand of his right hand with the apologetic remark you do look so like a beggar apart however from his threadbare garb and shambling gait there were personal traits of character about him which caught the attention almost at a glance and piqued the curiosity of even the least observant wayfarer the roguish hiberian mouth noted in his regard by mr grunison and the grey piercing eyes that looked up at you so keenly over his spectacles won your interest in him even upon a first introduction from the mocking lips soon afterwards if you fell into conversation with him came the loud snappish laugh with which as mr blankard gerald remarks the father so frequently evinced his appreciation of causal witticism uproarious fits of merriment signalizing at other moments one of his own ironical successes outbursts of fun followed during his later years by the racking cough with which he was too often then tormented from blanchard gerard's final reliquies of father prout the rev francis mahoney or father prout trudging along the boulevards with his arms clasped behind him his nose in the air his hat worn as french caricaturists insist all englishmen wear hat or cap his quick clear deep seeking eye wandering sharply to the left or right and sarcasm not of the sourest kind playing like a jack-o'-lantern in the corners of his mouth father prout was as much a character of the french capital as the learned armedian of the imperial library only a few years ago it was difficult to meet father prout he was an odd uncomfortable uncertain man his moods changed like april skies light little thoughts were busy in his brain lively and frisking as troutlets in a pool he was impatient of interruption and shambled forward talking in an undertone to himself 
with now and then a bubble or two of laughter or one short sharp laugh almost like a bark like that of the marksman when the arrow quivers in the bull's eye he would pass you with a nod that meant hold off not to-day he was very impatient if any injudicious friend or passing acquaintance who took him to be usually as accessible as any flonier on the macadam thrust himself forward and would have his hand and agree with him that it was a fine day but would possibly rain shortly a sharp answer and an unceremonious plunge forward without bow or good day would put an end of the interruption of course the father was called a bear by shallow pates who could not see that there was something extra in the little man talking to himself and shuffling with his hands behind him through the fine fleur and grand dame of the italian boulevard from a personal friend in recalling the rev francis mahoney i am forcibly reminded of a few lines at the beginning of old burton's anatomy of melancholy democritus as he is described by hippocrates and laertius was a little wearish old man very melancholy by nature averse from company in his latter days and much given to solitariness a famous philosopher in his age wholly addicted to his studies at the last and to a private life writ many excellent works substituting father prout's name for that of democritus the words are equally descriptive of the quaint little irishman he was a small spare man with a pale deeply lined face badly dressed with grey unkept whiskers and a certain waspish expression in his thin face which was utterly at variance not only with the good father's writings which for real larky fun as james hannay expressed it are unsurpassed but also with the really kind nature of the man his eyes were by far the best feature of his face keen bright and piercing they were eyes that held you their glance was very rapid and eager and instantly prepossessed you in his favour End of section 67section 68 of word portraits of famous writers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by marianne word portraits of famous writers edited by mabel e watton frederick marriott 1792 to 1848 from f marriott's life and letters of captain marriott although not handsome captain marriott's personal appearance was very prepossessing in figure he was upright and broad-shouldered for his height which measured five feet ten inches his hands without being undersized were remarkably perfect in form and modelled by a sculptor at rome on account of their symmetry the character of his mind was borne out by his features the most salient expression of which was the frankness of an open heart the firm decisive mouth and massive thoughtful forehead were redeemed from heaviness by the humorous light that twinkled in his deep-set grey eyes which bright as diamonds positively flashed out their fun or their reciprocation of the fun of others as a young man dark crisp curls covered his head but later in life when having exchanged the sword for the pen and the ploughshare he affected a soberer and more patriarchal style of dress and manner he wore his grey hair long and almost down to his shoulders his eyebrows were not alike one being higher up and more arched than the other which peculiarity gave his face a look of inquiry even in repose in the upper lip was a deep cleft and in his chin as deep a dimple a pitfall for the razor which from the ready growth of his dark beard he was often compelled to use twice a day from the cornhill eighteen seventy six he was not a tall man five feet ten but i think intended by nature to be six feet only having gone to sea when still almost a child at a time when the between decks were very low pitched he had he himself declared had his growth unnaturally stopped his immensely powerful build and massive chest which measured considerably over forty inches round would incline one to this belief he had never been handsome as far as features went but the irregularity of his features might easily be forgotten by those who looked at the intellect shown in his magnificent forehead his forehead and his hands were his two strong points the latter were models of symmetry indeed while resident in rome at an earlier period of his life he had been requested by a sculptor to allow his hands to be modelled 
at the time i now speak of him he was fifty-two years of age but looked considerably younger his face was clean-shaved and his hair so long that it reached almost to his shoulders curly in light loose locks like those of a woman it was slightly grey he was dressed in anything but evening costume on the present occasion having on a short velveteen shooting-jacket and coloured trousers i could not help smiling as i glanced at his dress recalling to my mind what a dandy he had been as a young man eighteen forty four end of section sixty eight section sixty nine of word portraits of famous writers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by laura langston word portraits of famous writers edited by mabel e woten harriet martineau eighteen o two to eighteen seventy six from h martineau's autobiography she was graver and laughed more rarely than any young person i ever knew her face was plain and you will scarcely believe it she had no light in the countenance no expression to redeem the features the low brow and rather large underlip increased the effect of her natural seriousness of look and did her much injustice i used to be asked occasionally what has offended harriet that she looks so glum i who understood her used to answer nothing she is not offended it is only her look eighteen eighteen from james payne's literary recollections in the porch stood miss martineau herself a lady of middle height inclined as the novelists say to embonpoint with a smile on her kindly face and her trumpet at her ear she was at that time i suppose about fifty years of age her brown hair had a little grey in it and was arranged with peculiar flatness over a low but broad forehead i don't think she could ever have been pretty but her features were not uncomely and their expression was gentle and motherly eighteen fifty two from h martineau's autobiography i saw miss martineau a few weeks since she's a large robust elderly woman and plainly dressed but withal she has so kind cheerful and intelligent a face that she is pleasanter to look at than most beauties her hair is of a decided grey and she does not shrink from calling herself old she is the most continual talker i ever heard it is really like the babbling of a brook and very lively and sensible too and all the while she talks she moves the bowl of her ear trumpet from one auditor to another so that it becomes quite an organ of intelligence and sympathy between her and yourself all her talk was about herself and her affairs but it did not seem like egotism because it was so cheerful and free from morbidness about eighteen fifty six end of section sixty nine recording by laura langston section seventy of word portraits of famous writers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt perard word portraits of famous writers edited by mabel e walton frederick dennison morris eighteen o five to eighteen seventy two from f morris's life of f d morris he was distinctly below the middle height not above five feet seven inches but he had a certain dignity of carriage despite the entire absence of any self-assertion of manner which in the pulpit where only his head and shoulders were observable removed the impression of small stature his hair was now of a silvery white very ample in quantity fine and soft as silk the rush of his start for a walk had gone his movements had like his life become quiet and measured at no time had there been so much beauty about his face and figure there was now partly from manner partly from face partly from a character that seemed expressed in all beauty which seemed to shine round him and was very commonly observed by those amongst whom he was it made undergraduates not specially impressionable stop and watch him 
servants and poor people whom he visited often spoke of him as beautiful eighteen sixty six from the spectator eighteen seventy two yet though mr morris's voice seemed to be the essential part of him as a religious teacher his face if you ever looked at it was quite in keeping with his voice his eye was full of sweetness but fixed and as it were fascinated on some ideal point his countenance expressed nervous high-strung tension as though all the various play of feelings in ordinary human nature converged in him towards a single focus the declaration of the divine purpose yet this tension this peremptoriness this convergence of his whole nature on a single point never gave the effect of a dictatorial air for a moment there was a quiver in his voice a tremulousness in the strong deep lines of his face a tenderness in his eye which assured you at once that nothing of the hard crystallizing character of a dogmatic belief in the absolute had conquered his heart and most men recognized this for the hardest and most business-like voices took a tender and almost caressing tone in addressing him End of section seventy section seventy one of word portraits of famous writers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by michael fascio word portraits of famous writers edited by mabel e wanton john milton sixteen o eight to sixteen seventy four from disraeli's curiosities of literature Salmasius sometimes reproaches Milton as being but a puny piece of man, and Homunculus, a dwarf deprived of the human figure, a bloodless being composed of nothing but skin and bone, a contemptible pedagogue, fit only to flog his boys, and rising into a poetic frenzy applies to him the words of Virgil, Monstrum horrendum informe, ingens qui lumen ademptum. A great poet thought this senseless declamation merited a serious refutation. Perhaps he did not wish to appear despicable in the eyes of the ladies, and he would not be silent on the subject, he says, lest any one should consider him as the credulous Spaniards are made to believe by their priests, that a heretic is a kind of rhinoceros or a dog-headed monster. Milton says that he did not think any one ever considered him as unbeautiful, that his size rather approaches mediocrity than the diminutive, that he still feels the same courage and the same strength which he possessed when young, when, with his sword, he felt no difficulty to combat with men more robust than himself, that his face, far from being pale, emaciated and wrinkled, was sufficiently creditable to him. For though he had passed his fortieth year, he was in all other respects ten years younger. And very pathetically he adds, that even his eyes, blind as they are, are unblemished in their appearance, in this instance alone, and much against my inclination, I am a deceiver. From Aubrey's Lives of Eminent Persons He was scarce as tall as I am. He had light brown hair, his complexion exceeding fair, oval face, his eye a dark grey. His widow has his picture drawn very well and like, when a Cambridge scholar. She has his picture when a Cambridge scholar, which ought to be engraven for the pictures before his books are not at all like him. He was a spare man, extreme pleasant in his conversation, and at dinner, supper, etc., but satirical. He pronounced the letter R very hard, he had a delicate, tunable voice, and had good skill. His harmonical and ingenious soul did lodge in a beautiful and well-proportioned body. In toto nusquam corpore menda frut. Ovid. From Kitely's Life of Milton, Asterix. In his person, Milton was rather under the middle size, well built and muscular. His deportment, says Wood, was affable, and his gait erect and manly, bespeaking courage and undauntedness. He was skilled in the use of the small sword, and though he certainly would not have engaged in a duel, he had strength, skill, and courage to repel the attack of any adversary. His hair, which never fell off, was of a light brown hue, and he wore it parted on his forehead, as it is represented in his portraits. 
his eyes were gray, and as the cause of his blindness was internal, they suffered no change of appearance from it. His face was oval, and his complexion was so fine in his youth that at Cambridge he was, as we are told by Aubrey, called the lady of his college. Even in his later days his cheeks retained a ruddy tinge. He had a fine ear for music, and was well skilled in that delightful science. He used to perform on the organ and bass viol. His voice was sweet and musical, and we may presume that his singing showed both taste and science. End of section 71《Section 72 of Word Portraits of Famous Writers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Word Portraits of Famous Writers. Edited by Mabel E. Watton. Mary Russell Mitford, 1786-1855 from s c hall's memories of great men i certainly was disappointed when a stout little lady tightened up in a shawl rolled into the parlor of newman street and mrs holland announced her as miss mitford her short petticoat showing wonderfully stout leather boots her shawl bundled on and a little black coal scuttle bonnet when bonnets were expanding added to the effect of her natural shortness and rotundity but her manner was that of a cordial country gentlewoman the pressure of her fat little hands for she extended both was warm her eyes both soft and bright looked kindly and frankly into mine and her pretty rosy mouth dimpled with smiles that were always sweet and friendly she was always pleasant to look at and had her face not been cast in so broad or outspread a mould she would have been handsome even with that disadvantage if her figure had been tall enough to carry her head with dignity she would have been so but she was most vexatiously dumpy miss landon hit off her appearance when she whispered the first time she saw her and it was at our house sancho panza in petticoats but when miss mitford spoke the awkward effect vanished her pleasant voice her beaming eyes and smiles made you forget the wide expanse of face and the roly-poly figure, when seated, did not appear really short. 1828 From James Payne's Literary Recollections I can never forget the little figure rolled up in two chairs in the little swallow-field room, packed round with books up to the ceiling, on to the floor, the little figure with clothes on, of course, but of no recognized or recognizable pattern, and somewhere out of the upper end of the heap gleaming under a great deep globular brow two such eyes as i never perhaps saw in any other englishwoman though i believe she must have had french blood in her veins to breed such eyes and such a tongue for the beautiful speech which came out of that ugly it was that face and the glitter and depth too of the eyes like live coals perfectly honest the while both lips and eyes these seem to me to be attributes of the highest French, or rather Gaelic, not of the highest English woman. In any case, she was a triumph of mind over matter, of spirit over flesh, which gave the lie to all materialism and puts Professor Bain out of court, at least out of court with those who use fair induction about the men and women whom they meet and know. About 1851 from james payne's literary recollections i seem to see the dear little old lady now looking like a venerable fairy with bright sparkling eyes a clear incisive voice and a laugh that carried you away with it i never saw a woman with such an enjoyment of i was about to say a joke but the word is too coarse for her of a pleasantry she was the warmest of friends and with all her love of fun never alluded to their weaknesses i well remember our first interview i expected to find the authoress of our village in a most picturesque residence overgrown with honeysuckle and roses and set in an old-fashioned garden her little cottage at swallowfield near reading did not answer this picture at all it was a cottage but not a pretty one placed where three roads met 
with only a piece of green before it but if the dwelling disappointed me the owner did not i was ushered upstairs for at that time crippled by rheumatism she was unable to leave her room into a small apartment lined with books from floor to ceiling and fragrant with flowers its tenant rose from her armchair with difficulty but with a sunny smile and a charming manner bade me welcome my father had been an old friend of hers and she spoke of my home and belongings as only a woman can speak of such things then we plunged in medius res into men and books eighteen fifty two end of section seventy two section seventy three of word portraits of famous writers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by laura langston word portraits of famous writers edited by mabel e woten lady mary wortley montague sixteen ninety to seventeen sixty two from Horace Walpole's Letters. I went last night to visit her. I give you my word of honor, and you who know her will believe me without it. The following is a faithful description. I found her in a little miserable bedchamber of a ready-furnished house, with two tallow candles and a bureau covered with pots and pans. On her head, in full of all accounts, she had an old black-laced hood wrapped entirely round, so as to conceal all hair, or want of hair, no handkerchief, but instead of it a kind of horseman's riding coat, calling itself a pet en l'air, made of a dark green brocade with colored and silver flowers, and lined with furs, bodice laced, a full dimity petticoat, sprigged, velvet muftis on her arms, gray stockings and slippers, her face less changed in twenty years than I would have imagined. I told her so, and she was not so tolerable twenty years ago that she should have taken it for flattery. But she did, and literally gave me a box on the ears. She is very lively, all her senses perfect, her language as imperfect as ever, her avarice greater. From Horace Walpole's Letters Did I tell you that Lady Mary Wortley is here? She laughs at my lady Walpole, scolds my lady Pomfret, and is laughed at by the whole town. Her dress, her avarice, and her impudence must amaze any one that never heard her name. She wears a foul mob that does not cover her greasy black locks that hang loose, never combed or curled, an old Mazarin blue wrapper that gapes open and discovers a canvas petticoat. Her face swelled violently on one side with the remains of a partly covered with a plaster, and partly with white paint, which for cheapness she has bought so coarse that you would not use it to wash a chimney. In three words I will give you her picture, as we drew it in the Sortes Figulani, Insanum Vatum Auspices. I give you my honor we did not choose it, but Gray, Mr. Coke, Sir Francis Dashwood, and I, and several others, drew it fairly amongst a thousand for different people most of which did not hit as you may imagine. 1740 End of section 73 Recording by Laura Langston Section 74 of Word Portraits of Famous Writers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo Word Portraits of Famous Writers Edited by Mabel E. Watton Thomas Moore, 1779-1852 to From Lee Hunt's Autobiography Moore's forehead was bony and full of character, with bumps of wit, large and radiant enough to transport our phrenologists. Stern had such another. His eyes were as dark and fine as you would wish to see under a set of vine leaves, 
his mouth generous and good-humoured, with dimples, and his manner was as bright as his talk, full of the wish to please and be pleased. He sang and played with great taste on the pianoforte, as might be supposed from his musical compositions. His voice, which was a little hoarse in speaking, at least I used to think so, softened into a breath, like that of a flute when singing. In speaking he was emphatic, in rolling the letter R, perhaps out of a despair of being able to get rid of the national peculiarity. From S. C. Hall's Memories of Great Men His eyes sparkle like a champagne bubble. There's a kind of wintry red, of the tinge of an October leaf, that seems enameled on his cheek. His lips are delicately cut, slight and changeable as an aspen. The slightly turned nose confirms the fun of the expression, and altogether it is a face that sparkles, beams, and radiates. The light that surrounds him is all from within. 1835 From S.C. Hall's Retrospect of a Long Life I recall him at this moment, his small form, an intellectual face, rich in expression, and that expression the sweetest, the most gentle, and the kindliest. He had still in age the same bright and clear eye, the same gracious smile, the same suave and winning manner, I had noticed as the attributes of what might in comparison be styled his youth. I have stated I knew him as long ago as 1821. A forehead not remarkably broad or high, but singularly impressive, firm and full, with the organs of music and gaiety large, and those of benevolence and veneration greatly preponderating. The nose, as observed in all his portraits, was somewhat upturned. Standing or sitting, his head was invariably upraised, owing, perhaps, mainly to his shortness of stature. He had so much bodily activity as to give him the attribute of restlessness, and no doubt that usual accompaniment of genius was eminently a characteristic of his. His hair was, at the time I speak of, thin and very grey, and he wore his hat with a jaunty air that has been often remarked as a peculiarity of the Irish. In dress, although far from slovenly, he was by no means precise. He had but little voice, yet he sang with a depth of sweetness that charmed all hearers. It was true melody, and told upon the heart as well as the ear. No doubt much of this charm was derived from association, for it was only his own melodies he sang. 1845 End of Section 74section 75 of word portraits of famous writers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by betty b word portraits of famous writers edited by mabel e watton hannah moore 1745 to 1833 from memoir of mrs hannah moore I was much struck by the air of affectionate kindness with which the old lady welcomed me to Barley Wood. There was something of courtliness about it, at the same time the courtliness of the vieille cour, which one reads of, but so seldom sees. Her dress was of light green Venetian silk. A yellow, richly embroidered crepe shawl enveloped her shoulders, and a pretty net cap, tied under her chin with white satin ribbon, completed the costume her figure is singularly petite but to have any idea of the expression of her countenance you must imagine the small withered face of a woman in her seventy-seventh year and imagine also shaded but not obscured by long and perfectly white eyelashes eyes dark brilliant flashing and penetrating sparkling from object to object with all the fire and energy of youth and smiling welcome on all around 1820 from s c hall's memories of great men her form was small and slight 
her features wrinkled with age but the burden of eighty years had not impaired her gracious smile nor lessened the fire of her eyes the clearest the brightest and the most searching i have ever seen they were singularly dark positively black they seemed as they looked forth among carefully trained tresses of her own white hair and absolutely sparkled while she spoke of those of whom she was the venerated link between the present and the long past her manner on entering the room while conversing and at our departure was positively sprightly she tripped about from console to console from window to window to show us some gift that bore a name immortal some cherished reminder of other days almost of another world certainly of another age for they were memories of those whose deaths were registered before the present century had birth she was clad i well remember in a dress of rich pea-green silk it was an odd whim and contrasted somewhat oddly with her patriarchal age and venerable countenance yet was in harmony with the youth of her step and her unceasing vivacity as she laughed and chatted chatted and laughed her voice strong and clear as that of a girl and her animation as full of life and vigor as it might have been in her springtime eighteen twenty five from a m hall's pilgrimage to english shrines her brow was full and well sustained rather than what would be called fine from the manner in which her hair was dressed its formation was distinctly visible and though her eyes were half closed her countenance was more tranquil more sweet more holy for it had a holy expression than when those deep intense eyes were looking you through and through small and shrunk and aged as she was she conveyed to us no idea of feebleness she looked even then a woman whose character combining sufficient thought and wisdom as well as dignity and spirit could analyze and exhibit in language suited to the intellect of the people of england the evils and dangers of revolutionary principles her voice had a pleasant tone and her manner was quite devoid of affectation or dictation she spoke as one expecting a reply and by no means like an oracle and those bright immortal eyes of hers not wearied by looking at the world for more than eighty years but clear and far-seeing then laughing too when she spoke cheerfully not as authors are believed to speak in measured pompous tones but like a dear matronly dame who had a special care and tenderness towards young women it is impossible to remember how it occurred but in reference to some observation i had made she turned briskly round and exclaimed controversy hardens the heart and sours the temper never dispute with your husband young lady tell him what you think and leave it to time to fructify end of section seventy five Section 76 of Word Portraits of Famous Writers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Word Portraits of Famous Writers, edited by Mabel E. Wootham. Sir Thomas More, 1480-1535 from moore's life of sir thomas moore he was of a mean stature well proportioned his complexion tending to the phlegmatic his colour white and pale his hair neither black nor yellow but between both his eyes grey his countenance amiable and cheerful his voice neither big nor shrill but speaking plainly and distinctly it was not very tunable though he delighted much in music his body reasonably healthful, only that towards his latter end, by using much writing, he complained much of the ache of his breast. In his youth he drunk much water, wine he only tasted of when he pledged others. He loved salt meats, especially powdered beef, milk, cheese, eggs, and fruit, and usually he ate a coarse brown bread, which it may be he rather used to punish his taste than from any love he had thereto for he was singularly wise to deceive the world with mortifications only contenting himself with the knowledge which god had of his actions et pater ejus 
qui arat as cognito reddit ai. From Campbell's Lives of the Lord Chancellors, Asterisk. Holbein's portrait of Moore has made his features familiar to all Englishmen. According to his great grandson, he was of a middle stature, well proportioned, of a pale complexion, his hair of a chestnut color, his eyes gray, his countenance mild and cheerful, his voice not very musical, but clear and distinct. His constitution, which was good originally, was never impaired by his way of living, otherwise than by too much study. His diet was simple and abstemious, never drinking any wine, but when he pledged those who drank to him, or rather mortifying than indulging his appetite in what he ate. From Life of Sir Thomas More, Asterisk He is rather below than above middle size, his countenance of an agreeable and friendly cheerfulness, with somewhat of an habitual inclination to smile and appears more adapted to pleasantry than to gravity or dignity, though perfectly remote from vulgarity and silliness. End of section 76 Section 77 of Word Portraits of Famous Writers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Word Portraits of Famous Writers, edited by Mabel E. Watton. Caroline Norton, 1808-1877. From Kemble's Records of a Girlhood. When I first knew Caroline Sheridan, she had not long been married to the Honorable George Norton. She was splendidly handsome, of an un-English character of beauty, her rather large and heavy head and features recalling the grandest grecian and italian models to the latter of whom her rich colouring and blue-black braids of hair gave her an additional resemblance though neither as perfectly lovely as the duchess of somerset nor as perfectly charming as lady dufferin she produced a far more striking impression than either of them by the combination of the poetical genius with which she alone of the three was gifted with the brilliant power of repartee which they especially lady dufferin possessed in common with her united to the exceptional beauty with which they were all three endowed mrs norton was exceedingly epigrammatic in her talk and comically dramatic in her manner of relating things she was no musician but had a deep sweet contralto voice precisely the same in which she always spoke and which combined with her always lowered eyelids downy eyelids with sweeping silken fringes gave such incomparably comic effect to her sharp retorts and ludicrous stories i admired her extremely eighteen twenty seven the next time was at an evening party at my sister's house where her appearance struck me more than it had ever done her dress had something to do with this effect no doubt she had a rich gold-coloured silk on shaded and softened all over with black lace draperies and her splendid head neck and arms were adorned with magnificently simple etruscan ornaments which she had brought from rome when she had just returned and where the fashion of that famous antique jewellery had lately been revived she was still une beauté triomphe à faire voir aux ambassadeurs from a personal friend the most beautiful of the beautiful sheridans caroline norton will also live in the memory of her friends as one of the most fascinating of women her voice was exceedingly sweet and musical her movements wonderfully graceful and with the solitary exception of theodore hook whose rough coarse wit spared no one her queenly bearing won her general adulation and deference her face was a pure oval her head was crowned by heavy braids of the darkest hair while the warmth and light which suffused her expressive countenance gave her a somewhat un-english appearance her eyes were dark black curly lashes swept over the warmly tinted cheek the lips were of geranium red the teeth dazzling white altogether she was a vivid piece of colouring and as she was always very beautifully dressed it did not require her literary reputation to make her at all times 
sought after and admired from s c hall's retrospect of a long life it seems but yesterday it is not so very long ago certainly that i saw for the last time the hon mrs norton her radiant beauty was then faded but her stately form had been little impaired by years and she had retained much of the grace that made her early womanhood so surpassingly attractive she combined in a single degree feminine delicacy with masculine vigor though essentially womanly she seemed to have the force of character of man remarkably handsome she perhaps excited admiration rather than affection i can easily imagine greater love to be given to a far plainer woman she had in more than full measure the traditional beauty of her family and no doubt inherited with it some of the waywardness that is associated with the name of sheridan End of section 77. Section 78 of Word Portraits of Famous Writers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Word Portraits of famous writers edited by mabel e watson thomas otway sixteen fifty one sixteen eighty five from gentleman's magazine seventeen forty five you'll be glad to know any trifling circumstance concerning otway his person was of the middle size about five feet seven inches in height inclinable to fatness he had a thoughtful speaking eye and that was all he gave himself up early to drinking and like the unhappy wits of that age passed his days between rioting and fasting ranting jollity and abject penitence carousing one week with the lord p l th and then starving a month in low company at an alehouse on tower hill from sir walter scott's memoir of mrs radcliffe asterisk otway heavy squalid unhappy yet tender countenance but not so squalid as one we formerly saw full speaking black eyes it seems as if dissolute habits had overcome all his finer feelings and left him little of mind except a sense of sorrow on a picture end of section seventy eight recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida section seventy nine of word portraits of famous writers this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Word Portraits of Famous Writers. Edited by Mabel E. Watton. Samuel Pepys, 1632 to 1703 from the cornhill magazine eighteen seventy four asterisk pepys spent part of a certain winter sunday when he had taken physic composing a song in praise of a liberal genius such as i take my own to be to all studies and pleasures the song was successful but the diary is in a sense the very song that he was seeking and his portrait by hales so admirably reproduced in Miner's Wright's edition, is a confirmation of the diary. Hales, it would appear, had known his business, and though he put his sitter to a deal of trouble, almost breaking his neck to have the portrait full of shadows, and draping him in an Indian gown hired expressly for the purpose, 
he was preoccupied about no merely picturesque effects but to portray the essence of the man whether we read the picture by the diary or the diary by the picture we shall at least agree that hales was among the numbers of those who can surprise the manners in a face here we have a mouth pouting moist with desires eyes greedy protuberant and yet apt for weeping too a nose great alike in character and dimensions and altogether a most fleshly melting countenance the face is attractive by its promise of reciprocity i have used the word greedy but the reader must not suppose that he can change it for that closely kindred one of hungry for there is here no aspiration no waiting for better things but an animal joy in all that comes it can never be the face of an artist it is the face of a vivois kindly pleased and pleasing protected from excess and upheld in contentment by the shifting versatility of his desires for a single desire is more rightly to be called a lust but there is health and variety where one may balance and control another end of section seventy nine recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida Section 80 of Word Portraits of Famous Writers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. Word Portraits of Famous Writers. Edited by Mabel E. Watton. Alexander Pope, 1688 to 1744. From the Guardian, 1713. Dick Distich, we have elected president not only as he is the shortest of us all, but because he has entertained so just a sense of his stature as to go generally in black, that he may appear yet less. Nay, to that perfection is he arrived, that he stoops as he walks. The figure of the man is odd enough. He is a lively little creature, with long arms and legs. A spider is no ill emblem of him. He has been taken at a distance for a small windmill. 1713. From Johnson's Life of Pope. The person of Pope is well known not to have been formed on the nicest model. He has, in his account of the little club, compared himself to a spider, and by another is described as protuberant behind and before. He is said to have been beautiful in his infancy, but he was of a constitution originally feeble and weak, and, as bodies of a tender frame are easily distorted, his deformity was, probably, in part the effect of his application. His stature was so low that to bring him on a level with common tables it was necessary to raise his seat. But his face was not displeasing, and his eyes were animated and vivid. His dress of ceremony was black, with a tie wig and a little sword. He sometimes condescended to be jocular with servants or inferiors, but by no merriment, either of others or of his own, was he ever seen excited to laughter. From Tyre's Historical Rhapsody on Mr. Pope. Pope, as Lord Clarendon says of the ever-memorable Hales of Eton, was one of the least men in the kingdom, who adds of Chillingsworth, that he was of a stature little superior to him, and that it was an age in which there were many great and wonderful men of that size. He inherited his deformity from his father, who turns out at last, from the information of Mrs. Rackett, his relation, to have been a linen draper in the strand my friend the shape which you and i will admire came not from ammon's son but from my sire as he expresses himself in his first epistle to arbuthnot he was protuberant behind and before in the words of his last biographer but he carried a mind in his face as a reverent person once expressed himself of a singular countenance he had a brilliant eye he had a brilliant eye which pervaded everything at a glance End of section 80. Section 81 of Word Portraits of Famous Writers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Laura Langston. Word Portraits of Famous Writers. Edited by Mabel E. Woten. Brian Waller Proctor, 1787 to 1874. From Froude's Life of Carlyle. I have also seen and scraped acquaintance with Proctor, Barry Cornwall. He is a slender, rough-faced, palish, gentle, languid-looking man of three or four and thirty. There is a dreamy mildness in his eye. He is kind and good in his manners, and, I understand, in his conduct. He is a poet by the ear and the fancy, but his heart and intellect are not strong. 1824 From S. C. Hall's Retrospect of a Long Life A decidedly rather pretty little fellow, Proctor, bodily and spiritually, manners prepossessing, slightly London elegant, not unpleasant, clear judgment in him, though of narrow field, a sound, honorable morality, and airy, friendly ways, of slight, neat figure, vigorous for his size, fine, genially rugged little face, fine head, something curiously dreamy in the eyes of him, lids drooping at the outer ends into a cordially meditative and drooping expression, would break out suddenly now and then into opera attitude, and a lachi dram la mano for a moment, had something of real fun, though in London style. From Fields' Yesterdays with Authors The poet's figure was short and full, and his voice had a low, veiled tone habitually in it, which made it sometimes difficult to hear distinctly what he was saying. When he spoke in conversation, he liked to be very near his listener, and thus stand, as it were, on confidential grounds with him. His turn of thought was apt to be cheerful among his friends, and he entered readily into a vein of wit and nimble expression. Verbal facility seemed natural to him, and his epithets, evidently unprepared, were always perfect. He disliked cant and hard ways of judging character. He praised easily. He impressed everyone who came near him as a born gentleman, chivalrous and generous in a high degree. End of section 81 Recording by Laura Langston Section 82 of Word Portraits of Famous Writers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox dot org recording by greg giordano word portraits of famous writers edited by mabel e watton thomas de quincey seventeen eighty six to eighteen fifty nine from mason's de quincey in addition to the general impression of his diminutiveness and fragility one was struck with the peculiar beauty of his head and forehead rising disproportionately high over his small wrinkly visage and gentle deep-set eyes his talk was in the form of really harmonious and considerate colloquy and not at all in that of monologue that evening passed and though I saw him once or twice again, it is the last sight I remember best. It must have been, I think, in 1846, on a summer afternoon. A friend, a stranger in Edinburgh, was walking with me in one of the pleasant, quiet country lanes near Edinburgh. Meeting us, and the sole living thing in the lane beside ourselves, came a small figure, not untidily dressed, but with his hat pushed far up in front of his forehead, and hanging on his hind head, so that the back rim must have been resting on his coat collar. At a little distance, I recognized it to be to Quincy, but, not considering myself entitled to interrupt his meditations, I only whispered the information to my friend, that he might not miss what the look at such a celebrity was worth. So we passed him, giving him the wall. Not unnaturally, however, after we passed, 
we turned round for the pleasure of a back view of the wee intellectual wizard whether my whisper and our glance had alarmed him as a ticket of leave man might be rendered uneasy in a solitary walk by the scrutiny of two passing strangers or whether he had some recollection of me which was likely enough as he seemed to forget nothing i do not know but we found that he too had stopped and was looking around at us apparently scared of being caught doing so he immediately wheeled round again and hurried his face towards a side turning in the lane into which he disappeared his hat still hanging on the back of his head that was my last sight of de quincey eighteen forty six from pages de quincey pale he was with a head of wonderful size which served to make more apparent the inferior dimensions of his body and a face which lived the sculptured past in every lineament from brow to chin one seeing him would surely be tempted to ask who he was that took off his hat with such grave politeness remaining uncovered if a lady were passing almost until she was out of sight and would get for an answer likely enough oh that is little de quincey who hears strange sounds and eats opium did you ever see such a little man little he was indeed like dickens and geoffrey the latter of whom had so little flesh that it was said that his intellect was indecently exposed from james payne's literary recollections in the ensuing summer after the publication of another volume of poems i visited edinburgh and called upon quincey to whom i had a letter of introduction from miss mitford he was at that time residing at laswad a few miles from the town and i went thither by coach he lived a secluded life and even at that date had become to the world a name rather than a real personage but it was a great name considerable alarm agitated my youthful heart as i drew near the house i felt like burns on the occasion when he was first about to dinner with a lord my apprehensions however proved to be utterly groundless for a more gracious and genial personage i never met picture to yourself a very diminutive man carelessly very carelessly dressed a face lined careworn and so expressionless that it reminded me of that chill changeless brow where cold obstructions apathy appalls the gazing mourner's heart a face like death in life the instant he began to speak however it lit up as though by electric light this came from his marvellous eyes brighter and more intelligent though by fits than i have ever seen in any other mortal they seemed to me to glow with eloquence he spoke of my introducer of cambridge and of the lake country and of english poets each theme was interesting to me but made infinitely more so by some apt personal reminiscence as far as the last name subject it was like talking of the olympian gods to one not only cradled in their creed but who had mingled with them himself half an immortal end of section eighty two recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida section eighty three of word portraits of famous writers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by sonia word portraits of famous writers edited by mabel e wotton anne radcliffe seventeen sixty four to eighteen twenty three from kavanagh's english women of letters asterisk anne ward's education was plain and somewhat formal she was shy she showed no extraordinary genius and the times were not propitious to the development of female intellect the young girl's person 
was probably more admired than her mind she was short but exquisitely proportioned she had a lovely complexion fine eyes and eyebrows and a beautiful mouth she had a sweet voice too and sang with feeling and taste from scott's memoir of anne radcliffe this admirable writer whom i remember from about the time of her twentieth year was in her youth of a figure exquisitely proportioned while she resembled her father and his brother and sister in being low of stature her complexion was beautiful as was her whole countenance especially her eye eyebrows and mouth from memoir of mrs anne radcliffe mrs radcliffe though a giant in intellect was slow in stature and of a slender form but exquisitely proportioned her countenance was beautiful and expressive End of section 83section 84 of word portraits of famous writers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org reading by matt perard word portraits of famous writers edited by mabel e walton sir walter raleigh fifteen fifty two to sixteen eighteen from the nineteenth century eighteen eighty one asterisk in appearance what manner of man was raleigh when in ireland there was much change of course from a dashing captain of eight and twenty when he was putting the unarmed men to the sword and hanging the women in dingle bay to the admiral of sixty-five who between the tower and the scaffold visited his old haunts in the county of cork for the last time in the three summer months of sixteen seventeen but all accounts agree in giving him a commanding presence a handsome and well compacted figure a forehead rather too high the lower part of his face though partly hidden by the moustache and peaked beard showing rare resolution his portrait a life-sized head painted when he was major of Eugel, was recently presented to the owner of his house where it had been years ago by the senior member for the county of waterford and another original picture of him when in ireland is in the possession of the rev pierce w drew of Eugel. both these irish pictures show the same lofty brow and firm lips there is an old and much prized engraving by van der Burke of amsterdam that seems to combine all his characteristic features the extraordinarily high forehead the moustache and peaked beard ill concealing a too determined mouth the likeness is most striking from aubrey's lives of eminent persons asterisk he was a tall handsome and bold man but his naive was that he was damnably proud in the great parlour at downton at mr raleigh's is a good piece an original of sir w in a white satin doublet all embroidered with rich pearls and a mighty rich chain of great pearls about his neck the old servants have told me that the pearls were near as big as the painted ones he had a most remarkable aspect an exceedingly high forehead long-faced and sourly fitted a kind of piggy he spake broad in devonshire to his dying day his voice was small as likewise were my schoolfellows his grandnephews from publications of the prince society asterisk in all the pictures we have of him there is almost nothing to suggest the typical englishman burly and robust about six feet in height he is rather thin than corpulent and in the vivacity of expression and the nervous cast of his features he resembles rather the modern new englander than the old-time englishman he was nineteen years younger than elizabeth and had as naunton describes him a good presence in a handsome and well compacted person fuller has already told us that at the time of his entrance at the court his clothes made a considerable part of his estate he seems to have had an innate love for the luxury and splendor of dress he lived at a period when gentlemen as well as ladies indulged in all the glory of gay colors 
edwards describing some of the more noted pictures of him says in another full length which long remained in the possession of his descendants he is apparelled in a white satin pink vest close sleeved to the wrist with a brown doublet finely flowered and embroidered with pearls and a sword also brown and similarly decorated over the right hip is seen the jewelled pommel of his dagger he wears his hat in which is a black feather with a ruby and pearl drop his trunk hose and fringed garters appear to be of white satin his buff-coloured shoes are tied with white ribbons End of section eighty four section eighty five of word portraits of famous writers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Robinson. Word Portraits of Famous Writers, edited by Mabel E. Watton. Charles Reed, 1814-1884. to 1884. From Coleman's Personal Reminiscences. On arriving at Bolton Row, I was shown into a large room littered over with books, manuscripts, agenda, newspapers of every description from the Times and the New York Herald down to the police news. Before me stood a stately and imposing man of fifty or fifty-one, over six feet high, a massive chest, Herculean limbs, a bearded and leonine face, giving traces of a manly beauty which ripened into majesty as he grew older large brown eyes which could at times become exceedingly fierce a fine head quite bald at the top but covered at the sides with soft brown hair a head strangely disproportioned to the bulk of the body in fact i could never understand how so large a brain could be confined in so small a skull on the desk before him lay a huge sheet of drab paper on which he had been writing it was about the size of two sheets of ordinary foolscap in his hand one of Gelat's double-barreled pens. Before I left the room he told me he sent Gelat his books, and Gelat sent him his pens. His voice, though very pleasant, was very penetrating. He was rather deaf, but I don't think quite so deaf as he pretended to be. This deafness gave him an advantage in conversation. It afforded him time to take stock of the situation, and either to seek refuge in silence or to request his interlocutor to propound his proposal afresh. At first he was very cold, but at last, carried away by the ardor of my admiration for his works, he thawed, and in half an hour he was eager, excited, delighted, and delightful. 1856 From the Contemporary Review, 1884 The man in truth justified Lavater, for his physiognomy was noble, and his body the perfection of symmetry and grace. Nature gave him a forehead as high as Shakespeare's, but broader, the mild, pensive ox eye so dear to the old Greek aesthetics, a marble skin, a mouth that was sarcasm itself. His personal attractiveness was phenomenal. In any room full of people, however illustrious, he became involuntarily, for he was as little self-asserting off his paper as he was dogmatic on it, the center. Living immersed in bohemianism, and in the society of a large-hearted, yet not very cultured woman, he never parted company with his Ipsden breeding, and his natural bearing was that of one born to command. From Eclectic Magazine, 1880 In personal appearance, Mr. Reed is tall, erect, of a commanding presence, with a full, expressive brown eye and a noble brow. His manner is singularly dignified without being arrogant, and in society he sustains an enviable reputation as a conversationalist. End of section 85. Recording by Robert Robinson. Section 86 of Word Portraits of Famous Writers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter Word Portraits of Famous Writers Edited by Mabel E. Watton 
Samuel Richardson, 1689 to 1761. From Barbold's Life of Richardson, asterisk. Richardson was, in person, below the middle stature, and inclined to corpulency, of a round rather than oval face, with a fair, ruddy complexion. His features, says one who speaks from recollection, bore the stamp of good nature, and were characteristic of his placid and amiable disposition. He was slow in speech, and, to strangers at least, spoke with reserve and deliberation, but in his manners was affable, courteous, and engaging, and when surrounded with the social circle he loved to draw around him, his eyes sparkled with pleasure and often expressed that particular spirit of archness which we see in some of his characters, and which gave, at times, a vivacity to his conversation not expected from his general taciturnity and quiet manners. From Richardson's Correspondence Short, rather plump, about five feet five inches, fair wig, one hand generally in his bosom, the other a cane in it, which he leans upon under the skirts of his coat, that it may imperceptibly serve him as a support when attacked by sudden tremors or dizziness. Of a light brown complexion, teeth not yet failing him, looking directly foreright, as passengers would imagine, but observing all that stirs on either hand of him, without moving his short neck. A regular even pace, stealing away ground rather than seeming to rid it. A grey eye, too often overclouded by mistiness from the head, by chance lively, very lively, if he sees any he loves. If he approaches a lady, his eye is never fixed first on her face, but on her feet, and rears it up by degrees, seeming to set her down as so-and-so. 1749 From Stevens Richardson, asterisk. He looks like a plump white mouse in a wig, with an air at once vivacious and timid, a quick, excitable nature, taking refuge in the outside of a smug, portly tradesman. Two coloured engravings in Mrs. Barbold's volumes gives us Richardson amidst his surroundings. One introduces us to Richardson at home. Half a dozen ladies and gentlemen are sitting by the open window in his bare parlour, looking out into the garden. There is only one spindle-legged table, a set of uncompromising wooden chairs, just enough to accommodate the party. Miss Highmore, whose hoop can scarcely be squeezed into her straight-backed chair, is quietly sketching the memorable scene. We are truly grateful to her, for there sits the little idol of the party in his usual morning dress, a nondescript brown dressing-gown with a cap on his head of the same materials. His plump little frame fills the chair and he is apparently raising one foot for an emphatic stamp as he reads a passage of Sir Charles Grandison. We can see that, as he concludes, he will be applauded with deferential gasps of heartfelt admiration. End of section 86section 87 of Word Portraits of Famous Writers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo Word Portraits of Famous Writers Edited by Mabel E. Watton Samuel Rogers, 1763-1855 to From S.C. Hall's Memories of Great Men. His countenance was the theme of continual jokes. It was ugly, if not repulsive. The expression was in no way, nor under any circumstances, good. He had a drooping eye and a thick underlip. His forehead was broad, his head large, out of proportion indeed to his form. But it was without the organs of benevolence and veneration, although preponderating in that of ideality. His features were cadaverous. Lord Dudley once asked him why, now that he could afford it, 
he did not set up his hearse, and it is said that Sidney Smith gave him mortal offence by recommending him, when he sat for his portrait, to be drawn saying his prayers, with his face hidden by his hands. From Jardin's Men I Have Known His personal appearance was extraordinary, or rather his countenance was unique. His skull and facial expression bore so striking a likeness to the skeleton pictures which we sometimes see of death, that the facetious Sidney Smith, at one of the dressed evening parties, entitled him the Death Dandy. And it was told, probably with truth, that the same satirical wag inscribed upon the capital portrait in his breakfast room, painted in his lifetime. From McKay's Forty Years Recollections My first look at the poet, then in his seventy-eighth year, was an agreeable surprise, and a protest to my mind against the malignant injustice which had been done him. As a young man he might have been uncomely, if not as ugly as his revilers had painted him, but as an old man there was an intellectual charm in his countenance, and a fascination in his manner, which more than atoned for any deficiency of personal beauty. 1840 End of section 87section 88 of word portraits of famous writers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by emma charlotte word portraits of famous writers edited by mabel e wharton dante gabriel rossetti 1828 to 1882. William Sharps, Dante Gabriel Rossetti. According to a sketch by Mr. Eyre Crow, dated about this time, Rossetti must have had anything but a robust appearance, being very thin and even somewhat haggard in expression. He went about in a long swallow-tailed coat of what was even in 1848 an antique pattern. That his appearance in his twentieth and some subsequent years was that of an ascetic I have been told by several, including himself. And in addition to such pen and ink sketches as the above, and of himself sitting to Miss Siddle, his future wife, for his portrait, there are the perhaps more reliable portraitures in Mr. Millais's Isabella, painted in 1848, and Mr. Deverell's Viola. On the other hand, a beautifully executed pencil head of himself in boyhood shows him much removed from the ascetic type of later years. Not unlike and strongly suggestive of a young Keats or Chatterton. While in maturer age he carefully drew his portrait from his mirrored image, the result being a highly finished pen and ink likeness. While speaking of portraits, I may state that Rossetti was twice photographed. Once in Newcastle, which is the one publicly known and upon which all other illustrations have been based, and one standing arm in arm with Mr. Ruskin, the latter being the best likeness of the poet-artist as he was a quarter of a century ago. There is also an etching by Mr. Menpes, which, however, is only founded on the well-known photograph. And finally, there is a portrait taken shortly after death by Mr. Frederick Shields. Hall Kane's Recollections of Rossetti Very soon Rossetti came to me through the doorway in front, which proved to be the entrance to his studio, holding forth both hands and crying, Halloa! He gave me that cheery, hearty greeting which I came to recognise as his alone. Perhaps. 
in warmth and unfailing geniality among all the men of our circle. It was Italian in its spontaneity, and yet it was English in its manly reserve, and I remember with much tenderness of feeling that never to the last, not even when sickness saddened him, or after an absence of a few days or even hours, did it fail him when meeting with those friends to whom to the last he was really attached. Leading the way to the studio, he introduced me to his brother, who was there upon one of the evening visits, which at the intervals of a week he was at that time making with unfailing regularity. I should have described Rossetti at this time as a man who looked quite ten years older than his actual age, which was fifty-two, of full middle height and inclining to corpulence, with a round face that ought, one thought, to be ruddy but was pale, large grey eyes with a steady, introspecting look, surmounted by broad, protrusive brows, and a clearly pencilled ridge over the nose, which was well cut and had large breathing nostrils. The mouth and chin were hidden beneath a heavy moustache and abundant beard, which grew up to the ears, and had been of a mixed black-brown and auburn, and were now streaked with grey. The forehead was large, round, without protuberances, and very gently receding to wear thin black curls, that had once been redundant, began to tumble down to the ears. The entire configuration of the head and face seemed to me singularly noble, and from the eyes upwards full of beauty. He wore a pair of spectacles, and, in reading, a second pair over the first. But these took little from the sense of power conveyed by those steady eyes, and that bar of Michelangelo. His address was not conspicuous, being, however, rather negligent than otherwise, and noticeable, if at all, only for a straight sack coat buttoned at the throat, descending at least to the knees, and having large pockets cut into it perpendicularly at the sides. This garment was, I afterwards found, one of the articles of various kinds made to the author's own design. When he spoke, even in exchanging the preliminary courtesies of an opening conversation, I thought his voice the richest I had ever known anyone to possess. It was a full, deep baritone, capable of easy modulation, and with undertones of infinite softness and sweetness. Yet, as I afterwards found, with almost illimitable compass, and with every gradation of tone at command, the recitation or reading of poetry. 1880 William Sharp's Dante Gabriel Rossetti As to the personality of Dante Gabriel Rossetti, much has been written since his death, and it is now widely known that he was a man who exercised an almost irresistible charm over most with whom he was brought in contact. His manner could be peculiarly winning, especially with those much younger than himself, and his voice was alike notable for its sonorous beauty and for a magnetic quality that made the ear alert, whether the speaker was engaged in conversation, recitation, or reading. I have heard him read, some of them over and over again, all the poems in the ballads and sonnets, and especially in such productions as The Cloud Confines, was his voice as stirring as a trumpet tone. But where he excelled was in some of the pathetic portions of the Vita Nova, or the terrible and sonorous passages of L'Inferno when the music of the Italian language found full expression indeed. His conversational powers I am unable adequately to describe. 
but during the four or five years of my intimacy with him he suffered too much from ill health to be a consistently brilliant talker but again and again i have seen instances of those marvellous gifts that made him at one time a sydney smith in wit and a coleridge in eloquence in appearance he was if anything rather over middle height and especially latterly somewhat stout his forehead was of splendid proportions recalling instantaneously to most strangers the stratford bust of shakespeare and his grey blue eyes were clear and piercing and characterized by that rapid penetrative gaze so noticeable in emerson he seemed always to me an unmistakable englishman yet the italian element was frequently recognizable as far as his own opinion is concerned he was wholly english eighteen seventy eight end of section eighty eight recording by emma charlotte section eighty nine of word portraits of famous writers this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. Word Portraits of Famous Writers. Edited by Mabel E. Watton. Richard Savage, 1697-1743. From Dublin University Magazine, 1858. Asterix. His companion. Who is he? He looks a little older, and is a great deal slenderer, and very much better dressed. That is, his clothes are well made, but alas, they are also well worn. He has an air of faded fashion about him. There is a decision in every line of the lank and long and melancholy visage. It is a veritable quixotic face, meagre and proud and high and pale. An exceeding woeful countenance which sadness and scorn alternately cloud and corrugate. It is mixed up with extreme diversities. The brow and eye are intellectual and bright, while the lower features are sensual and coarse. Humor and passion both lurk in the mouth, yet few smiles expand those lips from which laughter seems altogether banished, while the voice is sweet, soft, and lute-like. The pace is slow, and the gait has a certain pretension to importance which ill harmonizes with the rest of his appearance. This person is Richard Savage, a man whose rare talents might have brought him poetic immortality and a lofty pedestal in the Muses temple, had not his coarser vices, together with his pride and his ingratitude, dragged him down to the lowest moral depth, and buried the many bright things he had in brain and bosom, head and heart, in the same mud heap. From Johnson's Life of Savage he was of a middle stature, of a thin habit of body, a long visage, coarse features, and melancholy aspect, of a grave and manly deportment, a solemn dignity of mien, but which, upon a nearer acquaintance, softened into an engaging easiness of manners. His walk was slow, and his voice tremulous and mournful. He was easily excited to smiles, but very seldom provoked to laughter. End of section 89 Section 90 of Word Portraits of Famous Writers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Emma Charlotte. Word Portraits of Famous Writers. Edited by Mabel E. Wharton. Sir Walter Scott. 1771 to 1832. Lockhart's Life of Scott. His personal appearance at this time was not unengaging. A lady of high rank who remembers him in the old assembly rooms says, Young Walter Scott was a comely creature. He had outgrown the sallowness of early ill health and had a fresh, brilliant complexion. 
his eyes were clear open and well set with a changeful radiance to which teeth of the most perfect regularity and whiteness lent their assistance while the noble expanse and elevation of the brow gave to the whole aspect a dignity far above the charm of mere features his smile was always delightful and i can easily fancy the peculiar intermixture of tenderness and gravity with playful innocent hilarity and humour in the expression as being well calculated to fix a fair lady's eye his figure except the blemish in one limb must in those days have been eminently handsome tall much above the usual standard it was cast in the very mould of a young hercules the head set on with singular grace the throat and chest after the truest model of the antique the hands delicately finished the whole outline of that extraordinary vigour without as yet a touch of clumsiness when he had acquired a little facility of manner his conversation must have been such as could have dispensed with any exterior advantages and certainly brought swift forgiveness for the one unkindness of nature i have heard him in talking of this part of his life say with an arch simplicity of look and tone which those who are familiar with him can fill in for themselves it was a proud night with me when I first found that a pretty young woman could think it worth her while to sit and talk with me. Hour after hour, in a corner of the ballroom, while all the world were capering in our view. 1790. Froude's Life of Carlyle. I never spoke with Scott. Have a hundred times seen him, from of old, writing in the courts or hobbling with stout speed along the streets of edinburgh a large man pale shaggy face fine deep browed grey eyes an expression of strong homely intelligence of humour and good humour and perhaps in later years amongst the wrinkles of sadness or weariness he has played his part and left none like or second to him Plaudite. Sir John Baring's Autobiographical Recollections. More eloquent men I have known, I think, but never knew anyone so attractive. The variety of his conversation is stupendous, while it overflows with the most agreeable anecdotes, and almost every person who has figured in modern times has in some way or other been connected with him. His manner of talking is without the smallest pretense, and is gentle and humorous. His eye has a constant play upon it and around it. His dress is that of a substantial farmer, a short green coat with steel buttons, striped waistcoat and pantaloons and he put on light gaiters when we sallied forth. End of section 90 Recording by Emma Charlotte